Bishop Barron is the founder of Word on Fire Catholic Ministries and Auxiliary Bishop of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. He's a number one Amazon best-selling author and has published numerous books, essays, and articles on theology and the spiritual life. He has been invited to speak about religion at the headquarters of Facebook, Google, and Amazon, and is one of the most followed Catholics in the world on social media. Why do you think that people have written to you and to me suggesting that we converse? What's your take on this? It's surprising to me in some sense because it's it's not really my bailiwick, you know, although obviously I've been yeah. putting well, my nose I in think, there anyways. I think for a number of reasons, people see the work you do as at least opening a door to the religious dimension of life or a deeper dimension of life. I'll tell you a story. I got up in front of the uh, bishops of the United States because I was chairman of our um, committee on evangelization. And I talked about why we're losing a lot of young people. I went through some of the statistics and then reasons why we're losing them. And then I gave various signs of hope. And one of the signs of hope I gave was, I call it the Jordan Peterson phenomenon. And what I meant was this, I, I told the bishops, here's this gentleman gets up in a pretty non-histrionic way and speaks for several hours in some cases about the Bible. And young people all over the English speaking world are listening to him in theaters and they're by their millions on YouTube. And I said, you know, I'm not here to endorse everything that Jordan Peterson is saying, but I think that in itself is a sign of hope. And so that became a source of some conversation among the bishops. But I do think it's a sign of hope. And I said to them, and it's really in some ways to our shame, that you were making the Bible more compelling and appealing in many ways than we were. And so that's our that's our uh, bailiwick, that's our profession is the Bible. But you were opening the Bible up in a way that young people especially were finding very compelling. And you were indeed, I, I think, thereby opening a door toward a, you know, a richer and fuller understanding of the scriptures. I think that's part of it. But I also think it's the opening to the realm of objective value. So I think as I read you and listen to you, you talk a lot about uh, the, the objective realm of value. That's not simply a matter of my subjective whim, that you know, I'll decide what to do, or I, I make up my values as I go along. But there's something about the tradition, something about what's been given to us, an objectivity to uh, moral value, aesthetic value, intellectual value. And see, to me, that's, I mean, it's in a good way, a gateway drug to religion, because God, I would say, is the ground and the source of objective value. And when you sort of hyper-subjectivize the whole operation, that becomes, you know, questionable. So I think your work there, too, has, has sort of primed the pump for a deeper exploration of God as the source of these objective values. There's a couple thoughts I'd have about it, but I remember It's almost well as that if we need a going. third category, um, subjective, objective, and something else that, that is a, an admixture of both. I mean, there, there's things... I come across information in the biological sciences particularly that speak deeply of an intrinsic morality. And you see this, you can look at the work of Franz de Waal, for example, who's a Dutch primatologist, and he's been studying the social interactions of chimpanzees. And chimpanzees share a tremendous genetic overlap with human beings. And from an evolutionary perspective, we diverged from our common ancestor with chimpanzees something like seven million years ago. Our cultures also share, or our biology also shares uh, properties with that of bonobos, but I'm going to talk about the chimps for now. Um, Duval has been interested in what makes a chimp leader, so chimps organize their societies essentially in patriarchal fashion. The top chimp is male. Um, that doesn't mean there aren't high status females, there are, but the fundamental power structure appears let's say patriarchal and it's in the popular eye it's easy to assume that the top chimp is the, 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 the most physically intimidating but that's actually not the case what DeWall has shown was that is that 
alpha chimps who maintain stable sovereignty, let's say, are more engaged in reciprocal interactions than all the other chimps in the troop. So they're very generous and reciprocal. They play fair. Now, you can get the odd situation where a chimp troop will be ruled by a tyrant, but the, the structure becomes unstable and the tyrant chimp tends to be overthrown by coalitions of other male chimps torn to pieces. And so, and so then if you think, well, maybe there is a pattern that constitutes, this is the crucial issue as far as I'm concerned, is, is there a pattern of behavior that typifies stable sovereignty? And I think that's in, in some sense the fundamental religious question. Is there a pattern of behavior that constitutes stable sovereignty? And if so, what does it consist of? Jacques Panksepp has looked at rat behavior and rats, juvenile male rats, engage in rough and tumble play. And when you pair them together, if one rat is 10% bigger than the other, he can dominate the lesser rat. And so they do that and they establish their relative dominance. And then if you repeatedly pair them together, which is a crucial issue, it has to be repeated pairings, the lesser rat has to invite the dominant rat to play. So that's his role and the larger rat agrees and plays. But if the larger rat doesn't let the little rat win 30% of the time across repeated play bouts, the little rat will stop playing. And what I read that, it just blew me away. It's so significant because it shows, imagine that part of what morality is, it's morality is precisely that pattern of behavior that serves to keep re repeated interactions going. And those repeated interactions might be across days or weeks or months or years or decades or centuries or eons, it, a tremendously long time span. And so what you get is the emergence of a pattern of behavior that's stable for the individual and stable for society. And that, as that's instantiated more and more deeply, it becomes something we can observe and something that we adapt to and something that then becomes part of our central nature. And for me, that's the way into the that's the bridge between biology and religion right there. And because there, it looks like there's an evolved ethic that, that even goes beyond human beings. Yeah, no, I, I wouldn't deny for a second there's a biological ground for a lot of this business. And I'm with Lonergan, the great uh, Canadian philosopher, that the condition for the possibility of real objectivity is a properly constituted subjectivity. So I, I like your opening comment about something that bridges the two. Uh, we don't just live in you know, the subjective and objective as though they're, they're uh, discrete, but it's a properly constituted subjectivity, which means one free of various prejudices, one free of various fears, one free of, of games of self-denial and all that, that can properly intuit the objective value. And objective value does indeed come up out of the physical to some degree. I mean, we're, we're embodied uh, creatures. So the biological plays a, a role in that for sure. But I think, too, it goes beyond it. I mean, it goes beyond simply a, a question of, of survival of the individual or even of the species. But certain values, you know, of the truth and beauty and, and the good that transcend that, although they're grounded in it, for sure. This um, is one of the things I really wanted to ask you about, because yeah. I do think in evolutionary terms and across the time scale that evolutionary biologists and physicists have come to accept and so that's a universe that's about 15 billion years old on a planet that's about 4.5 billion and with life being three and a half and mammalian life say being 60 million years um, that's my time span the biblical time span is much truncated in relationship to that um, and that's that sets up a certain tension between the biblical stories certainly if they're read as 